Hey guys, welcome back to the Psalms to God podcast. We are continuing our series on literary devices in the Bible. Um, I really love this topic because taking note of a lot of these things is what made reading the Bible more interesting for me and helped me to get more out of studying the word. Now I can read passages over and over and every time I read it, I learn something new or I see it from a new angle or new perspective. And basically using the literary devices or techniques that I learned in literature classes is what has helped me to do this. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Now I'm an indecisive person, so I made an entire list of literary devices that exist. And of course I was like, I don't know which ones I want to talk about. I don't know the order that I want to talk about them. That's way too much to be decided on. So. I just used a random number generator to choose randomly from the list because, yeah, why not? Um, so today I chose lucky number seven and number seven on that list is allegory. So today we're going to be talking about allegory. Now I'm really excited that that's the one that came up because I feel like that's probably the first thing I really realized was something that was happening in the Bible, that you could read one story and it's actually telling you something spiritual or it's telling you like a totally different story or it's pointing to a different story that's happening in the Bible. Um, and I think that is really cool once you're able to start picking that up and seeing how that unfolds. So let's start off with the definition of allegory. And I have my notes here, so I'm going to spotlight those and we're going to start going over some different things. So first, let's talk about the definition. Now, I got this definition straight off the internet. Um, it's, you know, a couple of different sites I looked at and then kind of put that all together to see what it was that I thought best summarized it. So basically, an allegory is an expression of an idea through the use of symbolic figures and actions. Um, and it's usually about politics or morality or human behavior. And, you know, in the definition that I found, um, particularly in Merriam-Webster, it specifically says fictional figures or fictional characters. And definitely in these modern examples, you'll see that there are, that we are talking about fictional uh, people because they're, it's a fictional story. However, in the Bible, um, you know, a lot of the allegories that I will mention, it's, you know, you have a literal story that is an allegory for something that's happening later. Now, if you talk to certain biblical scholars or certain people who don't have the belief that, well, who have, who have different beliefs, we'll put it like that. Um, some of them may tell you that some of these stories are just allegories and that they're not, um, they're not literal or meant to be taken literally, but that they're an allegory for the bigger story. I believe that God is so awesome that he is able to create real life situations that point to future situations or point to bigger picture situations. Um, and so I believe they're both real stories and allegories. And that'll make more sense as we get through. But I wanted to point that out in the front of this episode or in the beginning of this episode um, because you will see different opinions across the interwebs um, and as you talk to different people and you may share a different opinion yourself um, so I did want to note that bias of my own and to highlight it because I did write fictional uh, figures in the definition uh, because that's what the the actual dictionary definition says so let's jump into a modern example. So I wrote down two modern examples. Um, the first, I think, um, I have read this book. I don't know if everyone has read this book. It was not required reading at my high school. So I added the second one because I think it may be slightly more popular amongst the, the, the crowd. But the first example that I put is Animal Farm by George Orwell. It is by and large, the most well-known example of an allegory that is out there. Um, it is perfect for explaining what an allegory is. So for those of you who haven't read the story, it is about a group of farm animals that overtake their farm. They basically out the humans and take over, start running their own farm. They come up with their own rules and their own way 
of um, you know maintaining the farm. And over time, the relationship between the animals starts to deteriorate. The pigs are the ones who are the leaders, and eventually they start to take on a lot of the characteristics of the humans that they have overthrown. And by the end of the story, the pigs and the humans are indifferentiable, and you can't tell the difference. So that is the surface level summary of the book. <laughs> but all of that is an allegory for the Russian Revolution, and it's very much a political statement about what was happening in Russia. And so <clears throat> I wrote down some of the mappings, um, just a few examples. You have the pigs, and they represent the communist leaders in Russia. These people came up, they said they were going to do great things. They were going to revolutionize the way things worked. They were going to change it and all of that. But they ended up doing exactly the same thing. They ended up letting the power go to their heads. Um, the dogs represent the KJB. The KGB. Um, they were basically the enforcers and they did the dirty work of the leaders the same way the KG, KGB did. The humans represented capitalists or capitalism, um, which was basically the enemy of the communists or the pigs um, in this case. And in some ways they have a lot of similarities and in other ways they're different. And so this is why you see this throughout the book. And then they have horses in the book and the horses just do all the work. These poor things, they're told that if they work so long that they'll get to retire and they'll get to just graze on the grass and enjoy life. And they're doing all of the heavy work and that retirement will never come. Now, I, I, I totally understand that from a capitalist society. I have never lived in a communist society, but I guess they don't get, I guess their retirement age keep shifting as well. So those are kind of the themes that correlate and you can see how you can assign different um, political things relating to that time and, and that situation to the characters in the story. And then when you read the story with that in mind, you get a totally different perception. It's not just talking pigs and talking horses saying that they want to run things on the farm. Now, a more popular story is that of the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Now, the entire series of the Chronicles of Narnia are an allegory for Christianity and the Bible. It goes all the way from creation in The Magician's Nephew all the way to Revelation and the End of the World in, I think it's called, is it The Last Battle? I think it's called The Last Battle. Um, I haven't read all of the Narnia books, but three of the books were made into movies, making it a whole lot more accessible to the general population. So I stuck to an allegory from uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because I believe that is the most popular Narnian story. But on the surface, Narnia is a fantasy, right? It's a bunch of kids escaping into the world of fantasy. They go into this other land, they have an adventure, right? It's all fun and beautiful and, and, and colorful and things like that. But it's an allegory, like I said, for the Bible. And in particular, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is an allegory for the gospel. So you have Aslan, who is also a lion, right? We have the lion and the lamb. Um, so it's, it's very obvious, representing him as a lion, that he is representing Jesus. Now, in Narnia, he seems to re represent both Jesus and God the Father kind of at the same time because Aslan is the one who creates the world, which Jesus was there at creation too. It's right. And then, of course, he also ends up dying. You know, he is innocent, but he dies and he comes back to life just like Christ did. So you can see the parallels here. Now, Edmund represents more of like a Judas character. Edmund is one of the siblings that gets transmitted or transported into Narnia. And he sells his siblings out for some sweets, the same way Judas sells Christ out for 30 pieces of silver. Um, and in the end, Edmund is very, very sorry. And he feel, you know he regrets what he has done. He sees the wrong of his 
actions the same way Judas does. But because this is a children's story, Edmund is redeemed and, you know, is it ends up becoming a king of Narnia and, you know, is forgiven and all goes back to normal. Judas does not have that end in the Bible. So there's a little bit of difference, which I think was handled differently because it's it's a kid's story, right? We couldn't have Edmund kill himself and you know that that would have been a little weird in, in, in the story. Um then you have Jadis or the White Witch. Um she represents Satan, right? She is the one who is instigating a lot of things. She's enslaving the people of Narnia in this eternal winter um where and I think it's interesting because Narnia is one of the few books that I think gets this right in the sense that Jadis is has this eternal, this everlasting winter that is cold and desolate. Um, a lot of times people associate Satan with fire, which is interesting because in the Bible, fire and God seem to go together, right? The burning bush, the pillar of fire in, in Exodus and things like that. Um, so to be far away from God would be far away from light, away from heat away from life, which would be more like a winter and an ice and things like that. So I thought that was interesting that that appears in the story as well. And of course, she is the instigator of a lot of problems. She is the one who's, you know, starting a war. She is the one who uh, crucifies Aslan, which is the same thing as Satan being the one behind the crucifixion of Christ. And then I also added in Lucy and Susan uh, because they are there to witness Aslan when he is killed. And they're also the first ones to see him when he comes back to life. And that is very much like Mary Magdalene and the other women. Um, all We see all of the women at the feet of Jesus when he is crucified while the disciples have scattered. In Narnia, you know, the men are preparing for battle while the women are in the woods watching you know the death of aslan and of course it is also the women who go to the tomb and first see him rise and the women of narnia lucy and susan are the ones you know there with aslan when he comes back to life in the story as well so that is you know a great example of allegory as well so now let's talk about the bible allegory in the bible right because that's where we're that's the whole point now as you can see i have the word esther here so you know we're going into esther the story the I, I wrote some other examples but the example that i love to use is the book of esther now the book of esther is one of my all-time favorite books and it's interesting because a lot of people argue that the book of Esther shouldn't actually be in the Bible because it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God by name. Like it never says anything about God specifically. Like you could, if you took it out and just had it somewhere and no one knew that it was in the Bible, you wouldn't know that it was in, that it was a religious text. Um, and I think it's interesting because as you go back and read it with this allegory in mind, you start to see that God is all over the book of Esther. So in the book of Esther, we start out with the king. Um, and there are a lot more components that are allegories in there. I just didn't write them all out. I will challenge you to find them. If you find them, leave me a comment and tell me um, what else you see in the book of Esther. That can be um, an allegory. So we start off with the king who is having some sort of feast and he calls to the queen and the queen is like, I'm not coming. I'm not going before these men. I don't want to. And she decides not to show up. So he gets mad and issues out a decree saying, you know, to banish her and to get rid of her. And once he's gotten rid of her, now he needs a new queen. So he sends out another decree to find the eligible women of the town, almost kind of like Cinderella-ish, though I'm sure it wasn't as PG-13 as Cinderella. Um, and in that search, he ends up finding Esther and making her the new queen. And at the time, his right-hand man is Haman. Now, on the surface, 
Like, I could totally see this being turned into, like, a Lifetime movie or a Hallmark movie. Or, like I said, it's it's almost Cinderella-ish. Um, maybe a, a darker version of Cinderella, especially since we like gritty, dark things nowadays um, in, the, in the Hollywood industry. But there is a beautiful allegory here that represents the gospel or the entire story of um, salvation. So if you think of the king as being God, right? God is the king of kings, right? And if you think of the king's first wife, Queen Vashti or Vashti, as Israel, Israel was very defiant. They did not obey their king. They did not obey their God. When God called out to them, they turned their backs and went into idolatry. They refused to appear before God as he had asked them and as he had called them. They did not obey him. And he got angry and he allowed them to go into captivity multiple times. And if you read in Daniel um, with the 70 weeks prophecy, he says 70 weeks are determined on you. They had 70 weeks to accept God, to accept the Messiah. And at the end, they rejected the Messiah. And when they rejected the Messiah, God took, not so much took the blessing away, but God took the message elsewhere, right? Now the message can go to everyone. Everyone is a part of the body. Everyone is a child of God that can be adopted in and can become part of Israel through circumcision of the heart, right? And in that regard, Esther res uh, represents this new church, this new covenant church that is able to uh, you know, enjoy God's blessings and be part of the new covenant and to have the law written on their heart. Now, Esther is shown as being much more obedient both to her uh, adoptive father, Mordecai, and to the king, right? And so you see a lot of parallels between Esther and the new church. Um, and interestingly, elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about how um, he has likened Zion to a comely woman there is a theme throughout the Bible of a woman representing a church. So Esther representing the new church and Queen Vashti representing the old church or Israel. That makes sense. And then you have Haman who is out here just causing havoc. He wants to kill all the Jews, right? He wants to kill the people of God the same way Satan wants to kill and punish the people of God. And so you see this altercation that happens between Haman and the people of God. Now, Esther is then tasked to do something about it. Esther is supposed to approach the king, which is potentially life-threatening because she's not allowed to just go to the king. She has to be called, uh, right? And so it's, it's, it's interesting because she fasts and then she goes to the king, whether she, whether he will take her or not. And then the king holds out his scepter to accept her coming to him. And when she comes to him with her request and with her problem, he allows her the power to reverse the situation so that Satan or Haman <laughs> cannot kill her people, but that the people can triumph over their enemies and this is the same thing that we read basically in revelation so christ comes to us the church and you know we are being attacked by satan as human beings as members of the church as many members of the body of christ and in the end when everything is just too much we will be approaching god and he will come back he will come to us right and the tables will turn so that it is Satan who is being persecuted and who ends up dead as opposed to us. And that will end in a massive feast or the supper, the, the, the uh, feast of the bridegroom, the wedding supper um, in heaven, which is pretty cool because, of course, in Esther, it ends with the feast of Purim or Purim, right? So you see this beautiful allegory where it's really about 
God the entire time. And I think it's it's really fun. The first time I went back and read Esther and saw these types of things, it just added so much more to a story that was already really interesting to me. So the story of Esther is about salvation. Um, so that being said, there are many, many examples of allegory in the Bible. Story of Esther, the fall of man. Remember I told you a woman is a church. Anytime you see something where there's a woman, turn the woman into a church or the church and turn the man into God if it's a married couple or try turning it into an apostate church and see what happens in the meaning. The same thing happens in Ruth. Ruth is about redemption. She is being redeemed by her closest kinsmen the same way we are redeemed by Christ. The Proverbs 31 woman, that is a very interesting read. We often talk about it in terms of a literal woman, but turn, go to that and read it and think that the woman is the church and the husband that she speaks of is God and see how that reads for you. There are two women in Revelation. Again, I t I'm telling you, anytime you see a woman, be ready for an allegory. Um, there are two women in Revelation. One is, uh, one is almost devoured by the dragon, but she is saved. The other is the whore of Babylon who sits on top of the beast. One is an apostate church, one is the remnant. Uh, the seven churches in Revelation as well, there is a lot of allegory there. There's allegory for different time periods um, within the history of the church. There is allegory for individual uh, meanings. It's a whole lot of things. Uh, the exodus uh, from the plagues, if you parallel the plagues and Revelation, the feast days, and the mission of Christ, all of that is there. And the parables of Christ in general, like just the parables of Christ, right? Like if you go through and read them, basically they're all allegories and he explains what they're an allegory for as he finishes them. So those are just a few, there are definitely more. There are probably allegories in the Bible I haven't even discovered yet because I am still a new studier. And by new, I mean, it's only been like, six or seven years since I really started digging deep in, I'm pretty sure you could spend a lifetime digging through this stuff and not find all there is to find. But I hope that some of this was helpful and beneficial to you. Let me know if you can think of any other examples of allegory within the Bible, what your favorite example is and what you think about it. Also, if you have a literary device that you would like to hear about um, how it relates to the Bible, go ahead and drop me a message for that too, and we will try to push it up on the list and make it a priority. So I will see you guys next time. Until then, happy studying. Bye.